Hello and welcome. I am Brandy Agerbeck. And I'm Heather Martinez. Woohoo! And uh, we are here to do a duet, mm. uh, each singing the praises, see what I did there, of our favorite markers. <laughs> ha ha! Exactly. Da da! And um, just a super quick contact center where this, where the heck this came from. We were together on a live session. I believe it was in my uh, membership community. And I said that I, when I teach folks in person, and honestly, sometimes when I teach virtually, I give them big one markers specifically because they're so freaking versatile. And then I saw Heather looking ready to say something. And what did you say, Heather? I was like, wait a minute. I would like to argue that a bit and say that the big one art marker is also just as versatile as the big one wedge. And you I felt a little even scared. more versatile. Well, I think it's more versatile. <laughs> and we had this moment where we're like, we can't, we can't argue in front of the kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll have to save this and have a chance to explore uh, why each of us love the tool tools we use and how much versatility we get out of the tools we use. So uh, let me, I'm going to hop on over here, explain what's behind me. So uh, today what we're going to be talking about is different shapes of nibs in your markers. We are absolutely going to be singing the praises also of Neuland markers specifically, because those are tools we love to use. But I found these wonderful outlines from Neuland from years ago which are almost still up to date. <laughs> but generally speaking, here we've got, uh, these are sort of, here we're looking at nib shape and the size of line you can make with your marker. And these two here are sketchbook sort of size, like itty bitty, small scale. These, these three in the center are all really what you think of as like a normal flip chart marker kind of size. And Heather and I are going, going to give lots of love for the big one markers it just happened these were cutouts before this one existed because i do believe this is the latest and greatest isn't it it is yes it's line. brand new to the family yes awesome and it's a beautiful family so generally speaking we're looking at three different shapes of nibs to get different kinds of lines and uh just quickly we're not really going to focus on this today but there's these two that say are these are round nib markers, as you can see. Sometimes they're called bullet tip or nib markers. Um, and those are fantastic if you want one single line. It's called monoline. And um, for some folks, they're like, I like that because I know exactly, exactly what I'm going to get. Because of the shape of the nib, it makes one type of line. And and just want to give a shout out for that nib uh, because we are going to talk about nib shapes we love because they give us a lot of different choices, not just one single choice. Anything to add there, Heather? Yeah, I, I love what you said about the mono line. Uh, a lot of beginners like it. I also use it if I'm going to outline something because I know it's going to be consistent. Um, and that's not what happens when we pick up a wedge or a brush marker. So some people might be a little intimidated and say, I don't know how to use one of those. Or maybe one of these is your favorite, but the other one is your kryptonite. So we're going to kind of demystify what, uh, what these nibs are designed for and what else they can do. Awesome. Yeah. Do we now go into the shape, into the anatomy? Yeah, let's talk about, well, let's talk about that? why we oh. love them first. Let's give our pitch. Okay, great. Okay, this is probably going to be the most competitive part of this, of the call. <laughs> <Do it laughs> but another, I think we're pretty much going to say the same thing, right? So why I love the big one art marker, and I love the number one as well. There's five different brush sizes that Neuland has, but this is the most versatile because I can use the side of the nib to get the widest line literally out of a brush marker in the world, or I can use the very tip and I can get a very, very fine line. And so for me, I love it because I have seven lettering styles that I can write with this nib alone. And these are the different styles. I can also go up and down in size. Right here, all you're seeing me is flipping the marker over 
using the ergonomic side and using the opposite side with just a little bit less pressure. So that's why I love the marker. Why do you love the wedge, Brandy? First, when Heather says ergonomic side, she's talking about putting your fingers in the ovals of the Neuland markers. Yeah. So this is ergonomic would mean your forefinger and your thumb are sitting in those ovals. If and that's your grip. Yep. Yep. Some people yep, have slightly different grip. grips, but yep. Exactly. Or not in the ovals, <laughs> in the other side. So yep. just wanted to clarify what that meant. And I love that you said kryptonite because truly the number one reason I'm not using brush markers is I have this much experience with them. So all the wonderful things you do with the art markers, I don't, when I, when I pick one of them up, I instantly feel like, <laughs> because you've got a much more flexible nib, right? So yeah, that's just to moves. say like, exactly, it moves. So for me, the reason I love the wedge, the big one wedge or chisel, you'll often see uh, the name chisel for this kind of shape of nib, is that I can get so many different lines out of it using all those wonderful angles, which we'll look at more closely in a moment. Basically, I love that I can get thick lines, medium lines, thinner lines, even thinner lines by doing all those little movements that you saw. Yeah. And when you're but using a monoline line. marker or a round nib, you can still move it all different ways. And unless you've like gouged it, you know, dented it somehow, oh, it's shit. always going to make the same line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so yeah. it's all about how you're holding it. And for me, it's about pressure and there's a bit of finesse. And for you, it's definitely about what we call indexing. So which way are you pointing the marker indexing it? Yeah. You have so much more vocabulary for this. I've had to I establish a vocabulary because my students say, what do you call that? Well, I look it up this is... or I tell great stories. <laughs> awesome. This is uh so I have new labels for this for the anatomy of a big one marker thanks to our conversation earlier with Heather and I, when I teach I'm like no you just kind of do this thing so I'll tell you a little bit about <laughs> different teaching styles and every time I see Heather teach I'm like she is so concise and and clear where I'm like we'll kind of do the thing that does a thing which some people like and I'm I'm I, I have to now, say I'm a better teacher hold on that. a second Brandy you're talking about <laughs> actually the physical part of using a marker now I yes. sit in a lot of your classes too and you share concepts that blow my mind I'm pretty sure that 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 little mind blowing emoji is the first one up every single time I go to respond to whatever it is you're saying so yeah thank you I think thank we you. have mutual admiration and that's why this is a duet and not a fight. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Harmony for sure. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't mean to be so self-deprecating, but I always admire that in Heather's, in Heather's teaching. And let me show you these new names I've learned. Thanks to Heather. So if we move over here, you can see a, a big blow up of the shape of the nib of a wedge or chisel tip marker. And if anyone is already wondering this, I just wanted to show you uh, the markers we're using are for the, from the wonderful German company of Neuland. So there you can see, I guess, I think it's focusing on this versus this, but um, N-E-U-L-A-N-D. So shout out to Neuland. Specifically, that's the spelling so you can find them. And part of the reason I couldn't show you that was it, like, we got our own like super fancy custom markers. Another beautiful thing they do. Huh. So I want to show you five different parts of the marker and um, that is in any kind of chisel tip or wedge shaped marker um, and the kinds of lines I get from it. So first, okay, first I'll just show you kind of if you can get a close up. You've probably seen this kind of shape in general. Now you'll notice that I didn't in my drawing add those angles because it's just a simplification. No worries. Don't worry about those particular angles. Um, but you're seeing that you've got the big one is fantastic. It's I think it's about the uh, almost three times the width of a of kind of the standard number one or uh, standard flip chart size marker. Um, and it's got this little bit of an angle here. You can see that. And see here's the the widest part. Here's that side. So let's talk about what you get out of a nib shaped like that. The first is, and I love I've got my I've got some friends here. Look at that. Ah. 
<laughs> so here insert with, cheering here my, sound. Exactly, exactly. I took these these what we call ghost markers, what I call ghost markers, the empty Neuland markers, and uh, marked exactly what I'm doing to get each one of these lines. So if we want the widest line from a wedge tip, we're going to put that width of the marker fully in contact with our piece of paper, and we're going to call that the broad edge. So that is the widest part of the, any chisel tip or any wedge tip, and that is along here. And you can see we get a wonderfully wide line. So yummy, just it feels good. Now that's our first, our widest line. Now our next widest line is, the next two are close, but do different things. Um, that's not the one, we want this guy. So now we're gonna use that width. So we're gonna put this width of the marker in contact with the paper try to get as much contact as possible to get the whole width of that nib. And we're gonna call this the second broad edge, which is the broad edge we're getting from the tip, not the side. And that is gonna to be touching this part and getting a wonderful medium line. Wonderful, now, and next, you are writing with the tip yeah. down, right? I am, tip yep. down, excellent. Yep. Do you ever draw like that? Nope. With the, Nope. Okay. That's exactly good, right. Good, Just wanted to see it. I good couldn't detail. quite see it. Yep. yep. Great. Yep. So it's going straight down. And next, this is what I, when I use a big one marker, um, this is very much a whole lot of whole lot of what I'm doing. And I really am thankful Heather gave me a name for this, which is that I'm using the face of the marker. So here you can see I'm not putting the entire uh, with the broad, the entire broad side of the marker down. Um, and I'll show you why in a moment. Um, I'm using kind of like the top two thirds of the face of the marker. And when I do that, so that is using kind of this area. We're just going to make hatch marks because it's a bigger area here. And if I do that, And I'm left-handed, so I often ignore the ovals. So if anyone is on oval ergonomic slash oval watch, don't follow me. Because <laughs> again, being a lefty, I just use whatever I can use. So that's often what I'm using to make big lettering. And what's nice about using the face is we can move it around and get a pretty even line, any part in those letters. Believe me, Heather's got far more detail about letters. But if I was trying to get the absolute widest line from this broad edge, I would have to be fully turning, oh, there you go, fully turning my marker for every stroke. And for a whole lot of work I do, there's so much an element of speed. So yes. I love using the face, right? I so love using the face because it gets me a pretty large, a very large, very even lettering that I don't have to stop and think about at all. Um, and happily, the more muscle memory we get for any of this, the less we need to think about it in that moment. So that is line three. Next, who's my next friend? This one, we were trying to, I don't think we really, this is like a little, one night we discovered that I use and Heather doesn't use enough to have a name for it, I guess. <laughs> but this is when we're getting a thinner line because we are drawing with this edge, that that edge, but um, only kind of on the very, 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 very corner. Only the little bit of the corner is touching. And when we do uh, that, that is when we're getting, we're, oh, let me do this. That would be the tip of the narrow, a narrow edge from the tip of the marker. So to give ourselves a common vocabulary for that, that is when we are going this way. So again, only that edge is touching and we're getting a thinner line. Fantastic if we're drawing lines, what happens if we're drawing letters and we don't want that whole side touching, then we're gonna go to one of two choices. And in these two cases, what we're doing is either using one corner, this would be considered the uh, tip, tip of the marker's corner, or using one of these corners, which is considered called the heel of that nib and that corner. So in this case, the tip corner edge, 
Again, we're using that, that front corner or top corner of the tip. And in the second kind, we're going and using the heel or the back or bottom, depending on how you're kind of thinking about this orientation, the heel tip, heel corner. Now, when we do this, we can get, I always, my, I nickname this kind of being on point, like a ballerina, because I'm thinking about just that little bit. In these two cases, we have just that little bit of the corner and it helps give us a thinner line for smaller letters. And I just put that behind myself, didn't I? All right, we'll go over here. Just on point. And if I want a super, super tiny light line, I'm gonna go just on point and like very little pressure. Not a whole lot of difference between that and that, but. And the, why would you use a heel corner? You might use a heel corner because the more we use these felt nibs, the more they get nice and soft and fuzzy. Now, some people, they don't love their marker until it's kind of soft and fuzzy <laughs> because it makes it very easy to get more even, even lettering. Um, some folks, they're like, as soon as it starts getting soft and fuzzy, they have stopped loving their marker and they put in a new nib because happily these are all I'll have refillable inks and re-nibbable nibs so we can replace the nibs. I love anytime I get to say re-nibbable. <laughs> I get <laughs> excited too. Yeah, exactly. Re-nibbable. So those are five types of lines we can get from this one single marker when we are using. You've made a bouquet, a beautiful go. bouquet. Right? There you go. This is just like for any of us marker nerds, this is just heaven. So Lots of fantastic choices. And if you're watching now, grab any kind of chisel tip marker you have. Uh, fantastic. If it's an Oiland. Uh, it'll look a lot like this. If it's a big one, it'll look like, a lot like this. But just take the time to actually find what kind of different surfaces, what kind, different kinds of contact can you get from the different edges and the different corners. And I loved having this conversation with you too, because it was so fun to see all the different sides and what we called it. Not if you don't mind, I'm going to steal that ba ballerina. I'm going to start calling that the yeah. ballerina <laughs> because it is awesome. on point. That's fantastic. Yes, please do. So I don't have all awesome props Brandy does because it's not really in the nib. So let me show you what my, or I shouldn't say my, we all get to have brush nibs. I don't own it, but let me show you what the brush nib looks like at the anatomy of the brush nib. And then talk a little bit about the finesse. So when it comes to the brush nib, I'm just going to draw that out because I love this. I'm not a straight line person. I'm a curvy line person. And there's a lot of wonderful uh, lettering artists out there who do make gorgeous straight lines. And boy, I am not one of them. So I'm going to draw my curvy, curvy nib here. And I'll just show you the two main places that we're going to draw from are from the side here or from the tip. And a lot of times I too will call this the broad edge of the nib because it makes the widest line. And then for the tip, we want to put as little pressure on that as possible. And when I have a, when I show people how to first start using the brush marker, I have them hold it as horizontally as possible to the paper like this. This is where they can put the most amount of pressure. Look at all that ink that I just laid down. That's going to be that your yummy. broadest line. <laughs> However, Sorry, we're not, it's, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's super delicious. <laughs> and we're never going to write like that unless we slow way down because the, the angle of my hand is too odd. So if I were to pretend like this is some type of a tool, like a ratchet, click, click, click. My next click up is probably a little bit more comfortable. I can put some pressure, not as pressure as, as much pressure as I just did. I'll go up again and use a little bit less pressure. Now it's the marker is starting to feel a little bit more comfy in my hands. I'll use a little bit less pressure. And then finally, I'll hold the marker down, whether I'm a righty or a lefty, I'll still hold the marker down and I will pull up just kissing the paper to get the thinnest lines. So here you can see that I'm doing my downstrokes here and then my upstroke 
is here. And we can get all of this variation while we're writing, but it does take finesse. And chances are, if you did this exercise along with me, that your most comfortable line is going to be somewhere in here. And when we're lettering and when we're going really fast, like when we're graphic recording, we want to go what's most comfortable. Some people don't aren't very heavy handed and they might be over here. I tend to be very heavy handed when I letter. So I'm somewhere between these two because I can still push a lot down. And I want to say a few things about the, the nibs, like Brandy was saying, you know, wh when do we love our nibs? Well, the markers come from the factory at a conical shape. And if you hold the marker with the ergonomic grips, over time, what will happen is the marker will start to go upward. This one's brand new. Um, the tip of the nib will start to go upward, and then it will develop what I call an underbelly because it's been flexing in this area for so long, this will start to get much uh, thicker. And so what will happen is, is whenever I'm writing with my marker and I'm, I'm writing really, really, you know, thick lines, thin lines, whatever, if I develop that underbelly, all I have to do is flip that over and with the same pressure, now this is a brand new marker, so it's not gonna do it, but with the same pressure, it'll actually look lighter. I can use the same amount of pressure just because it hasn't developed that underbelly because there's still quite a bit of tension there. And so you'll know when it's the right time to replace your nibs. And I tend to be very heavy handed. So I replace them a lot, probably every time I do a big job that I know I'm going to be taking a, a big job. When I say a big job, I mean like two or three days, I will definitely replace all of my nibs because by the end of the last day, my nibs are pretty worn. I definitely re-nib far less often, but um, for me, it's usually when the the top, the tip of the nib is so fuzzy that when I draw any kind of line, it has that kind of wispy, wispiness at the end. Like it's going to have, that's going to happen. Like that's part yes. of a felt nib, but yeah. there's definitely, a, it just kind of crosses the line where I'm like, it's wispy and, and kind of um, breaking off at the end of the line enough that I feel like it looks a little sloppy. Yeah. Not exactly yeah. what I want to do. And that little that little scale that I just did, I do that every single time I pick up my brush nib. I'll do it on a scrap piece of paper because I'm looking for two things. One, how much ink is in this? And two, what's the condition of the nib? Because if there's not enough ink, we don't realize it, but we will press harder trying to get that ink out. We won't even realize it. And I will tell you that if you've never replaced a nib, in one of these markers, then you've probably gone too long. Meaning the very <laughs> first time I replaced my nib, it didn't look like a nib anymore. When I got the new ones, I went, whoa, these don't even look like the same thing. So chances totally. are, if you've never replaced a nib in your marker, it's time. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's a great, um, what I love is that Heather and I both have previous experience in fine arts using lots and lots and lots of different tools. And if you if if you're not bringing that experience into this kind of live work on flip charts or giant sheets of paper, uh, you may not you just think a tool is a tool. Like I bought the tool, I use the tool. So I definitely want to say that that definitely take if this is more if this is newer to you, uh, definitely take more time to find those sides and edges and to notice what is the condition to test things out. Um, cause you know, sometimes you've got that mentality of like, well, the marker is the marker, just throw it in my bag. And then, you know, you get there and you're like, oh, this tool isn't working as well as it could. Um, yeah. it just popped in my mind. I have to share this story where I didn't refill one of my markers enough and I needed it. And it was a multi-day graphic facilitation project. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? So, cause I was not in Chicago. So I actually asked for, I think one of the maintenance men brought me, I asked for a piece of string and I basically uh, taped the marker to the piece of string, the end of the marker. Do you see where I'm going here, Heather? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I taped the marker with a piece of string and then I just whipped it around in a circle so we could use centrifugal force, centripetal force, cent centrifugal force. force. There we go. To, uh, to push whatever ink was in the barrel out to the edges. No so way. It worked. And I still keep that string in my kit just in case. But that I is not where I thought you were going to go with it, but that's oh. great. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, like awesome. a, like a, um, what's the, 
There's a name for the machines that do that. Roller <laughs> scientists rides? yelling. I don't know. <laughs> that too. No. I definitely think of, yeah. Like an autoclave. I don't, I have no idea. I have no, no idea. It's not an autoclave, but yeah. Yeah. That heats okay. things up and sterilizes them. I know that oh, okay. one. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, so again, I think, again, this is about the tools you're using and really understanding how many different kinds of lines you can get from any kind of tool you're using. Also, like we were just describing, noticing what is the lifespan of the tool. I think, you know, for me, a huge reason I was, I, it was an easy switch to Neulid markers was that it is refillable ink and re-nibbable nibs. And so it's like, you know, this is a, a, as long as I've got a bottle, I got my marker, a bottle of ink and a little uh, inventory of nibs, it only takes moments to switch something out if I need to switch something out. So that's absolutely definitely right. Shout out. Yeah. And I wanted to just quickly reinforce what Heather was saying about the shape. So I love that again, just an overview, um, uh, any kind of wedge or chisel tip, you're going to have these edges. You know, that's just, you know, the shape of the marker. And what's so fantastic about that brush nib is you are always going to have that curve. And this is the first time I've thought about the underbelly of a brush nib. So yeah. again, that could be that could be enough to help you recognize like, oh, I'm this kind of person or I'm this kind of person or you're both. You know, we're certainly not saying you have to pick one single tool. Um, and I love that we just had two, two fantastic explore, explorations with two different nib shapes and can That's get right. so much out of each of them. One of the things I want to talk about too is, is about confidence. So Brandy, mm. you actually use the big one marker for pretty much everything, right? So you yep. graphic record exactly. with, with that. And I have found that I'm using mine at about 75% of an entire graphic recording because I can get the versatility of line that you can, but it didn't start out that way. I had to learn how to use this marker and it was time in the saddle. It was getting that sense of command, building up the muscles, because this is such a bigger tool than, say, a pencil, right? I mean, it's very different. So give yourself a break. Give yourself a minute. Even if you've been using the number ones and you're going up in size, it's going to get bigger. All of the lines are going to be bigger, but it's also going to require you to use more muscles in your hands, your arms, your shoulders than you'd normally use just sitting at your desktop writing with a pencil. So I just wanted to to remind people to, this takes time, right? When did you feel like you had that sense of command and control? Maybe I don't know about time, but um, like, how did you know when you're like, this is my tool? That's a great question. Um, and and just to reiterate to what Heather just said, I, I recognize that I don't go for an, a brush nib because I don't have that muscle memory. I just haven't spent the time with it. And it's learnable. It's absolutely yes. learnable. Yeah, I, can, I had to I learn can it. tell you. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's one of those things that if, if that was the next priority, I would say, okay, I'm going to put in time, just kind of like a practicing scales as a musician, um, mm -hmm. that kind of like repetitive, just getting to know the tool again, trying to build up muscle memory in that second type of nib. Um, it's a good question about when I, when I felt it's interesting. It just happened in my graphic facilitation career. The first three years were dry erase chisel tips, chisel okay. nibs. Um, and then when I moved over to paper, I was using Mr. Sketch markers, again, another chisel slash wedge. And the main, the biggest thing was thankfully our colleague, Rob Ben in, uh, Alberta, Canada lent me his tool belt of big one, uh, Neulin markers, this, these guys, uh, previous generation of these guys. And instantly I had all this experience from first the dry erase, lots of years with the, probably a dozen years with the Mr. Sketches. So once he, I got to get my hands on one of these, I didn't yeah. personally didn't have a huge learning curve and I absolutely loved, I don't have a number one within reach here, but with the, with this nib, what I was doing before is when I wanted a really thick line, cause I was mm -hmm. using thick lines for certain parts of my work. I had to draw three parallel lines with the Mr. Sketch. Right. So the first time I got to just go up and and make this giant line, I'm like, oh, I'm sold. <laughs> yes, I love I think that. that. Right. And but again, I'm recognizing that even though that was a new tool to me, 
I wasn't coming in at square one. Yeah. I already had experience finding those different sides of a smaller chisel or wedge nib. So that, and I, I don't know, I love bold lines for me. I I'm just like, heck yeah. Like making a line, making a mark. Like for me, it's like, let's go. Like when you, like I interrupted you, unfortunately, as you made that really juicy mark, <laughs> with the art marker. So I, if anyone is wielding a big one and you're, you're less confident, I get it. It's cool. <laughs> I just know that like, for me, part of the reason I could jump in so much was that previous chisel yeah. nib experience and just a holy heck, I get to make giant lines. That's right. <laughs> That's great. right. I love it. I love it. And I asked that question because we all come to this work from some kind of an experience. And it sounded to me Absolutely. like when you talk about whiteboard, boy, that is my kryptonite. There's just, it's slippery, it can erase. There's all kinds of things that, um, and some people are great artists at whiteboard and that's just not what I'm great at. And those always come in wedge nibs, unless you find mm -hmm. one that's round, right? So it's, there's no totally. brush in that one. And yeah, so for exactly. me, when I started as a graphic recorder, I was a round nib girl. I was round nib all the way. And then I learned how to use a wedge a little bit better. And I was afraid of the brush. I didn't touch it for probably my first year and a half. And then someone, that's all they had. I went to a graphic recording. There were five of us graphic tandem recording with each other. And she showed me all of her markers and they were all brush nibs. And I had seen them but I had never used them. And I picked them up and she showed me a couple of little tricks that demystified the whole thing about the side and the tip. And I went, that's great. Okay. And then when I started teaching with the number one, I would show all these different lettering styles and how to go big and how to go small, but it could only go about three different levels of size. The number one question that I kept getting from my students was, when is Guido going to invent the big one? art marker. And I kept going to him and going to him and I finally gave up asking him. And then when he sent me a beta test, I was in heaven. It was like what Brandy said. It was like, you've just totally. given me this gift of boldness that I didn't have before. And I had to keep it under wraps for like four months. I wasn't even allowed to tell anybody. I was testing it and writing with it. And it's, it's now it is, it is my go-to. And like Brandy, this is what I'm using for nearly, well, for me, it's nearly all of my graphic recording. I still use some of the smaller ones too, but yeah. Yep. That's it's there. Yep. So if anybody's out there going, I'm too afraid to go big. If you're a sketch noter, we get it. You might not need a big one unless you've got a really big sketch note uh, book or sketchbook. But if you're working, if you're planning on working on a flip chart, you've got five different levels of hierarchy or six, you know, depending on what you're doing um, right on your, on your, on your paper. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. I, I love that you were mentioning the kryptonite of the dry erase board. Not that you felt that way about dry erase boards, but to completely understand. And that, that is precisely, you know, I'm not, I can't, I can't really demonstrate what this does because I'm working, I have paper underneath this, but this is a white chisel tip whiteboard marker. And when I was working on these giant dry erase boards, you can make a line, but anyone who's used a dry erase board knows it's extremely hard to fill in any kind of area because you go over something you've drawn on a whiteboard and it erases what you just wrote. That is precisely why part of my style is making those kind of hatch marks to shade things in. That is entirely because I started out on dry erase boards. And that was the first three years. But part of that is getting the muscle memory of knowing what angle my body now can, I pretty much only ever draw my hatch marks in that kind of angle. So, you know, my, my body knows exactly what to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just realized I had, that was the guy we were looking at before. So, you know, that, that's, but you had to really turn your of... hand to make a different set of lines. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause normally it is always just, and all it is, is I'm using the natural fulcrum in my body. That's right. It is truly, my body knows exactly what to do. Cause I'm using, using my body to hinge here. Yeah, but I appreciate that you meant that we got on this dry erase part because again, that that is might be the same nib shape, but that's going to behave a lot differently than these guys, and all of these work a little bit differently depending on scale. But 
yeah, very, I really appreciate Heather saying we're always bringing up different experiences and with this when we're doing this work for sure. Yeah. Excellent. Can I show folks like just a kind of an example of the kind of things I'm doing with those lines? Yeah. Good? Let's see. Let's Excellent. see your drawing. So the uh, folks who know me know I love starting out with three colors. <laughs> And like Heather already said, I, I do pack number one markers when I'm doing graphic facilitation work, and I usually barely touch them just because I can do so much with these guys. And I'm going to do my own check of how much space I've got here, but I'm using that broadest edge when I'm creating my kind of central figures. You know, a lot of folks know this is... You know, that's a that's a brandy guy. So they've got their threes. So in so you see, I even turned it just a little bit to make those lines a little smaller, a little more narrow, but that's just practice of getting pretty much that whole broad edge touching the paper. Um I can, you know, now I'm gonna go on corner to get a little eyeball. Right. So again, just turning that on point like the ballerina. Um, <laughs> I wish I had a little more space up there, but I could say, you know, one, two, three, you know, three in one. Clearly, we've already showed you more than three. But if we just think about the, the widest and the uh, medium and the narrow, if I'm capturing a whole lot of stuff, I'm just going to give you some squiggles here as an example of um, some text. I can go in, oh, let's go even more. So I'm kind of giving you kind of a dummy of a few different uh, levels of information using size, but then I might take my marker. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use that medium width I have to make a stem, a connector that goes between the main idea and the next level. And then I can do a thinner line that goes from this level of information out to this level. So now I'm doing more of that ballerina on point type of line. And this is when we tie it all together. <laughs> I go back to that broadest line and I give myself a nice big container, a nice big blob shaped container around that main idea. So again, because I know how to turn, I don't have to, I, I don't have to pick up a different marker. I right. can use that same marker. And I didn't point this out when you were doing it because I was so mesmerized by your drawing that you're actually using a quite a bit of your body, your arm to do that thicker line. Whereas when you're writing on the tip, you're just going, you're just moving just with your hand, maybe wrist and elbow. But when you're having to keep that broad, broad edge all the time, you're having to use more of your body. And it creates yep. great contrast in your drawing. Awesome. Thank you. And again, if I maybe I want to add a thought bubble to my person, I'm going on point. So just using the point, uh, something that, that uh, those using this edge, maybe I want to add a whole lot of different descriptors. So, you know, there might be, let's see, we can refill ink, we can refill, we can re-nib. Am I in screen? Just barely. <laughs> Maybe yeah, you're there. Frame. You're there. Um, let's see, different edges. So that is a way I can get some thin lines to kind of make a list of things. And, oh, I had something else, Heather. Oh, I can also give this guy a thinner ear because the ear doesn't need to be as big as his whole outside edge of his body. And again, that's just playing with turning the marker and whatever the last thing was, it went out of my brain. We'll be okay. There's plenty. You could definitely get the idea of the flexibility that we have. Yeah. Already. Those are fantastic lines. Oh, wait, there's more. There's more. Now I'm going to pass it on to Heather. So you can show Aww. us the ways you're using the art marker. Yeah, I look forward to it. So 
again, we're using those broad, broad edges and those really thin lines. So let me show you what that might show up like if I'm going to do some lettering. And so grabbing my, let's see, let's start out with the 601 here. And notice that when I opened it, I did open it with two hands, but I had to snap it, right? So when you open a big one, you hold it like this and just pop the very end of it. That's true for both the wedge and for the brush. And I'm going to move this aside for a second because I'm going to go really big. In fact, I'm going to go so big writing in a lettering style that I call wacky Western that I'm probably not going to get the whole word on the page because I'm writing the word balance. And this is wacky Western style. Notice, and this is really fast, so it's it's wacky. It doesn't have to be perfect. I'm not a straight-lined person. Sometimes I'm okay with little white pieces being in there. Sometimes I cover them up. Notice that every single time I write a broad line, any line, I am pointing my marker towards that broadest line that I want to write, right? So I'm constantly moving my hand. I do all my stems. Then I do all of these serifs because they're all horizontal, so I can do it in the quickest way possible. So my in, I've got something off screen here. There we go. So with each one of these lines that I'm writing, I'm actually cleaning that up. Okay, so we'll just start there. So we'll stop there. But notice I'm using that broad, broad part to make this really, really big letter. Now, if I wanted to draw, I'm probably going to not use the broadest side for me as much. Uh, say I wanted to draw a feather, I would do what's called instead of a perpendicular line drawing, I would do parallel line drawing, which means I'm at the top of my nib and I'm pulling. And if I do add a little bit of weight, I'm adding pushing. But again, when I came down here, I was a little bit on the side. So I might be on the side a little bit there. And the whole time I'm drawing, I can play with the, the line weight by just how thick I want to go. So I'm right on the very tip here. I'm playing with, you know, some very brushy looking marks. And I can vary those lines at any time that I want to. So I'm really playing like this is a brush and I'm pulling the whole time I'm drawing. So a lot of my drawings tend to look like that. And then same exact marker, if I want to, again, just use the broad edge, but now I'm going to go down a little bit. Um, this lettering style, I call this National Parks. Very straight lines here, which is not natural to me. Uh, and now I'm going to, folks, there we go. Yeah. Folks can notice how much slower your hand, your, how much your hand slowed down. Yes. So it's a great, great example. Between those yeah, two. because I'm doing straight lines, right? Yep. I mean, these are much straighter than what I'm used to. There's actually a few people in our um, in our industry that I think about when I write that lettering style because it's so straight to me. But then my go to the one that I love that again can be just as big as this can go as small as I'm going to write it write it now is sign painter. So again, I'm using the thickest part. Notice how much my hand is moving as I'm writing. And what's wonderful about having, you know, working with this color palette is I can come in now and add more color later. So if I'm working on, say, uh, either a title or um, one word that I really want to emphasize and I want people to see, I might come back in and embellish this just a little bit because I can write it with this yellow. The 500 yellow is a fantastic color because it can live on its own in on white paper. You can kind of see it, but then you can always go back and, and do more to it. And then of course, um, we know that if we want to be um, more, like if you want to be able to read letters, if they're all in capital letters, they can be a little bit difficult to read. So a lot of times we need to be able to have uppercase and lowercase. And so here I'm using the least amount of pressure, probably the last, what, one sixth or one seventh of um, the tip to do lowercase. And so here we've got all of these different sizes 
double stroking will make a thicker line. Um, you know, just coming down in terms of this is the same size nib, but I'm using a little bit less pressure. Here with the yellow, I was using quite a bit of pressure, probably the same, if not more here. But notice too, that it was very fast for me. So some lettering styles are slower, some are faster. And then when we can use the, the, the lower case, now it's much easier to read. And I'll just show an example of that. If we were to write the word shape in all caps versus lowercase. And Brandy, I think you do this too with your words mm -hmm. that you use uppercase and lowercase as a way of hierarchy. We have to look For at sure. each one of these shapes and then put it together, each one of these letters as a shape and put it together and see the word. But we can read ascenders and descenders very quickly. And so now the readability changes and we say, oh, that's the word shape, right? Beautiful. So that's how I use, that's how I get all these different sizes out of just one nib. So I, I love that we started this out as sort of a, oh yeah, very initial conversation was a bit of a, oh yeah, my marker is better than your marker. And clearly with our love of our, um, respective nib shapes. <laughs> There's a whole lot of love and, and a whole lot. And bo both of us love the shape we love because of its versatility. Yeah. And the reason I'm so comfortable with my nib shape is because I have tons and tons of practice with it. I love that you shared that you didn't start out feeling that way about the brush nib, but with that experience, you got more and more confident with that nib shape. And both of us have found all these wonderful ways we can use one single tool. And I feel like we also snuck in a lot of other good, <laughs> yeah, a lot of other good uh, tips in there. So excellent. Thank you, Heather. Anything else we should say just other than go out other there? Than and... We absolutely love our markers, right? So we love them. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. totally. And, and I would say uh, just reach please. out to us. I mean, we both teach, we both teach um, in our parts of the field. And so reach out to us, whether you are a brush lover or a wedge lover, I'm sure we would accept you either way, <laughs> but reach out to us Absolutely. if you want to know more about how to master these markers, how to feel like you have command and control over them. Awesome. We even love you if you're, you're at the round nib stage. Yes. We will bring you into more. But I will tell you a secret about shape. the round nib. You have to Please. be precise. The versatility of the line can cover a multitude of sins. That's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for watching. We hope you will rejoice in the tools that you already love, that you will explore more opportunities within single tools you already love, find even more things they can do, and uh, maybe even try some new tools that can do their own unique things. So Heather, I am so thankful we we moved that quick, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> into, this, into this time together to be able to uh, show our love for our tools and uh, for each other and our work. Thank you so much, Brandy. I'm glad we got to do this duet. Just you and I. Just you and I sharing, sharing our, our love, love for markers. markers. I like the wedge. And I like the brush. We, we can, can draw and make, make letters. letters. Just you and I. I with Noyland at and our, our side. Yes, we did it. <laughs> we did it. It was crummy, but Yay. we did it. <laughs> We're good. Okay. We're awesome. We are. We're both pinned. We are. We are. <laughs> <laughs>